This is Scott Richman. And Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. All right, Arnie Sherman, guess who our guest is today? You know who it is. It's Mr. Grant Keir, right. candidate, Democratic candidate for the U.S. House here in Montana. We had him We had him as a guest a while back when he was still the uh, executive director of Five Valley Land Trust. So we it's did. great it's- having him come back as the candidate so we can probe him uh, in a different <laughs> position from the last time he was here. <laughs> This is some conversation. <laughs> We're going to probe. But anyway, Grant, welcome. Thank welcome you. back. I'm u- uncomfortable already. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't be uncomfortable. <laughs> but I do want to begin by asking you, why are you, in this era, let me start this way, in this era where politics has gotten dirty and muddy and everything's on the table, nothing's off the table anymore, why did you decide to run for uh, office, federal <laughs> office, in fact? Honestly, that is exactly why I decided to run for office. Uh, My wife and I both had just been so fed up with the direction politics was taking, with the kinds of people who were running for office and the way that politicians were treating uh, everyday people and the process of politics. Um, Everything we loved about this country we felt like is at stake right now, and we believe we needed people to step forward who come from everyday life experiences uh, respect other human beings in our state and our country and are willing to talk about issues straightforwardly. And, um, and my wife felt like this is something we could take on as a family and we agreed, uh, I could be successful in this position. So we decided to step forward and, and take this on. And how has the experience been for you so far? It's been extraordinary. Um, you know, I'm, I'm honored to have the endorsement of former, under our former secretary of agriculture, Tom Vilsack. And he was one of the first people I talked to when I thought about doing this. Mm-hmm. And he told me, Grant, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. And the most rewarding win, lose, or draw on the election. And he's been right. Um, it's been the hardest thing I've done, but the amount of support that people have reached out and offered me, uh, the gratitude that I receive, uh, East and West and North and South across the state to, to just be somebody who wants to talk about respect of one another, uh, face issues head on, even if they're t- tough to talk about mm. and talk about uh, the diversity of opinions that we have in the state and how important it is that we come together and find really good solutions to our problems together. And people are grateful that I'm doing it. What's been, what's been hard about it? Tell us what's been hard. Honestly, uh, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, I just feel like the, the breadth of issues that people care deeply about in this state is is enormous and the responsibility I feel like I have to understand where they're coming from and get to know uh, the issues that are important to other people, not just the ones that are important to me has been, um, has been really stimulating, but it's also, you're constantly learning, you're constantly meeting people. And if you care enough to really listen to people and want to serve them, every person you meet, you're learning about a different perspective about issues in our state. What is the, what's an, what's an issue that you weren't prepared or that you weren't anticipating being an issue? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, the two issues that I hear a lot about on the campaign trail right now that I did expect to be issues are health care um, mm. and, frankly, uh, women's rights. And uh, those are two issues I came in caring deeply about as well as the uh, environment and public lands. Um, but there are um, issues that are meaningful to individual people around their uh, maybe uh, health and human services, um, mental health care services in rural communities. Um, those are issues that I didn't have as much experiences in mm. and that are in a state of crisis right now. Um, learning about what it means to be a teenager growing up in our high schools today. Um, the, the stress that our youth are under in their schools. Uh, the lack of access they have and the stigma associated with reaching out to people for help is really tremendous. And uh, even though we just made progress about expanding the services around mental health care to some of these kids in some of our rural communities, just months after we were making that progress, these services are wiped out and people are left with uh, feeling like they've moved backwards instead mm. of forward. So that's a, a good example of an issue that uh, I kind of knew about on the periphery. I'd seen the headlines, sure. but when you get out and you meet with the kids that are impacted or the, uh, the social workers who are trying to take on those additional caseloads now that other people have, are no longer in the communities to serve, uh, it's just a tremendous pressure that you feel to try to do right by these people and to make sure that everybody served well. Many of our listeners know this and understand this, but for those who don't, this is the largest congressional district in the United States by size and by population. 
Right. I mean, if you're running in California, I don't know, they got 57 congressmen. Everybody has a smaller piece of territory, right. Right. and the issues are more localized. You have a state. You, you have a whole state. <laughs> you know, I think there's only three states that have the same dynamic where there's only one congressman and uh, two senators. So, what kind of differences do you find when you're campaigning in, like, you know, you know, northeast Montana as opposed to Missoula, Montana? Well, you know, I, that's a great question. Um, I think, I, I think there's less that we have um, that divides us than there is that unites us across Montana. And I think, um, I think the diversity of the needs of our tribal communities, of our rural communities, of our urban communities. Um, are all distinct and the issues are different in each community. And in some cases, you know, you even see this in Western Montana, right? Uh, the, the community culture in the Bitterroot Valley is different than the community culture in the Blackfoot Valley or the Flint right. Creek Valley. And so there are those subtle differences, but, but I think um, what I have found inspiring to me that, want, that made me want to run is how much I think we have in common as Montanans. And what I have learned is that it doesn't matter if you're in the big city of Missoula or out in a small rural community um, like Forsyth, uh, people want really good schools for their kids. They believe that every kid in our state deserves a world-class education. Um, they are deeply troubled about our healthcare services and recognize it doesn't matter if you're on the far right or the far left, our healthcare system is completely broken and it really needs people to step forward and start trying to fix it. And that's true if you're uh, somebody who's trying to seek healthcare or you're trying to manage a rural hospital. Mm -hmm. um, our critical access hospitals in rural Montana are um, really always just right on the edge of being able to stay open. And our rural uh, community health centers are always right on the edge. And I think people are, um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for somebody who sees the things that unite us across Montana and is willing to use that unity as a form of leadership. I think there's a huge opportunity to come together, mm. uh, find some practical solutions, which I think Montanans are great at doing. Um, and really not just lead to solve problems in Montana, but in my opinion, uh, maybe show that Montana can be a leader in our country right now. I deeply believe that our east-west divide, our rural-urban divide um, that we are led to believe exists in Montana is, uh, is exactly the model of what we're told is divides us across the country. Sure. I think if we can find points of unity to focus on as leaders, um, this state has an opportunity to be a huge leader in our country right now. I want to get your insight into uh, one aspect of running for office. You're running as a Democrat. I'm sure, as I would be, chomping at the bit to, um, you know, meet with or debate your Republican opponent. But you have to go through a primary process. So what's it like running initially against people who are on the same side of the aisle as you are? Yeah, I'll be honest. That's been the hardest part of this. Um, the hardest part of this has been... Uh, trying to find those uh, yeah. sometimes subtle differences right. between you and other candidates. Um, I, you know, I, and also to be respectful of the other candidates within your party. Um, the flip side is it's also been an incredible uh, opportunity for me to grow. I'm not a, I'm not a career politician. I stepped into this coming from a world where all of my success was about being nonpartisan, was really about focusing on issues and helping people and not about partisan rhetoric. And so to step into this world has been a real adjustment for me. And I think the primary process has really um, hardened me in a way that sets me on the right path to be ready to take on a Greg Gianforte and gives me the confidence that, well, if I show up against him in a debate, I'm ready to, to meet him and uh, beat him in that debate. And it gives me the confidence that I really understand the issues um, in, a, in a deeper uh, and and sort of uh, reinforced way instead of just in an intuitive way. So as a scientist, one thing that's been really important for me is to talk about evidence-based decision-making. Mm. And when I get into this race, uh, what I had to really do is sit down and say, what are the things that I believe just because I've always believed them? And what are the things that I believe because I really know and I can explain them? And so it's really mm -hmm. forced me as a person to go back to my own personal beliefs, even some core beliefs, and say, why do I stand? Why is this important to me? And is this something I've just grown to believe sort of offhand? Or have I really tested my thoughts about this issue? And I think um, that's really prepared me to not only succeed in this primary, but be ready for the general election. Well, I think it would help you be general, you know, prepare for the general election. Just because most people who are applying for a job don't have the other candidates who are applying in the same room at the same time. And everybody 
listening to what everybody has to say and then trying to decide on which one they, mm. they want. It is a very odd circumstance right. to put somebody th- through. That's right. And how's the race going? Where do you think you stand in this process? As we're, as we're, when, it, when is the primary election? Primary election is June 5th. I believe that we are, uh, as of recording, 57 days away from the well, primary. Right. So in 57 days, you'll know whether your campaign is successful. Or not. How do you think it's been going? I Where think it's you- been going great. Um, I think that the reception we've had across the state's been phenomenal. Um, I think that people are hungry for a message of bridge building. Um, one of the things I say a lot on the campaign trail is that right now we need people who in, are willing to mend fences before they're building walls. And I think that um, in Montana, people succeed every day in our communities by getting folks around the table and talking about what problems are or barriers are out of their success. And when Montanans do that, they aren't looking across the table at, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? They're looking at, right. do you care about this community the same way I do? And can we help each other make it stronger? What, what are some of the criticism you're hearing from out there about Gianforte? You know, um, how much time do we have to uh, finish up this you piece? Got, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> no, I think the greatest criticism I hear, look, what I hear constantly as a preface to people talking about Greg Gianforte, and this is Republicans and this is independents and Democrats, uh, they respect his business background and what mm. he's done to succeed in business. And it's, it sort of stops there. And I think number one is that people don't think that he respects them. They don't believe that he shows up and listens to them. And they don't really believe that uh, at the end of the day, he's reflecting Montana values in Congress. And I hear those three things over and over again. And I think people are looking for an alternative right now. And I feel really confident that um, what I've presented them in terms of my beliefs and the, the value I place on everyday Montanans and trying to be helpful to them mm. has really given me a chance to be confident that I can take him on and beat him in the general. Sure. Election. And that's important insights. I mean, those are not necessarily what you would hear in other congressional races around the country. Those, that, that sort of critique. Well, let me go deeper, right? In yeah. Montana, we, you know, I you hear all the time, it's a, a small town with long streets. Mm-hmm. One of the things people pride themselves on is that you have access to the people that you elect to office. Mm. And in Montana, it hasn't mattered if it's the governor or a senator or a congressman or your your mayor or city council. Um, by and large in Montana, if you make the effort to walk into somebody's office, you're going to get a chance to sit down with them and tell them what you think, tell them what you need, and they're going to hear you out. That's been a tradition that people here take a lot of pride in. And, uh, and Craig Jean Forte is not giving people that level of respect. He's, uh, he's scheduling meetings that... Uh, he turns up a couple hours early for so that the folks he didn't want in the room don't actually get to talk to him. He's not holding any in-person town hall mm. meetings. He's holding his meetings online so he can pick and choose the questions he hears. Uh, I think Montanans really value, even if you don't agree with them on every issue, they uh, they really value right. showing up, looking in the eye, the giving them respect, well, and giving that dialogue. I mean, yeah. this state is you know a classic example of retail politics at at its you know pinnacle. Yeah, in California. New York, Illinois, you, you have a rare opportunity to ever meet your congressman or senator unless you're at a high ticket event. Here, you expect to meet them, you know, just in a, on a, in a regular, you know, way. Right. When I first came to Montana and, and started work at the, at that time at the university running the World Trade Center, I got phone calls the first week from every elected official calling me saying, hey, I just want you to say hi, welcome to Montana. You don't get that in other places. So there okay. is that connection. And if you're sensing that, you know, your potential opponent is disconnected from that, that's a, that's a, a difficult, you know, situation f- to overcome because people expect the op- the opposite of that. They expect to be able to see them once or twice or three times during the campaign cycle. Right. That's exactly right. And I think that, um, honestly, I believe it's too late for him to recover from that. I don't think that, I think that's somebody that, those are qualities people pick up on the minute they meet you and the first time they meet you. And I think people here get a lot from a first impression, and I think he's made a first impression on a lot of folks here, and I think there's a huge opportunity for uh, somebody I wonder like if he has buyer's talk. remorse. Well, I'm serious. I mean, the, 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 he, he, you know, he, he got the, 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 the ring. Now, is that something that he's kind of like, all right, I did it. Well, most folks so is he who end up get elected and then have the, and, and, you know, sort of gravitate towards the, 
I guess the, the envi- well, the environment of you know, I mean, you go to Washington D.C., you have lobbyists, you have all these people sucking up to you. I mean, that's the reality of it. And some people get addicted to that. They like that kind of uh, environment, that, that, that kind of situation. If he's a former CEO right. and had a lot of employees, now he's you know he's a congressman that. You know, and and in many places in Montana, you could probably walk around, nobody would even recognize him. In Washington D.C., everybody knows you. Right. Every elevator operator in in the in you know in the Capitol knows who every you know the who who the four hundred thirty five congressmen are. And, and you know that's a town right now that sadly operates on money. And uh, you know, campaign finance reform is a major right. issue I hear about on the campaign trail. But Greg Gianforte is, I think, the, if not the wealthiest, the second wealthiest yes. member of Congress. Wow. So money uh, carries a lot of weight in that town, and I'm sure that he enjoys a lot of stature because of his wealth, and I'm sure that's, uh, that's something he enjoys a lot. So we've briefly talked about all the things you have hearing from constituents about what their issues are. You can't ignore, when you're in the political process, what's happening on the national level. And, you know, and the, uh, the breakdown in civility, you know, the, the creation, for better or worse, of the whole fake news syndrome all of this stuff. It's just an ugly, messy place. You get elected, you go to Washington. What are the first things that you would like to accomplish when you're there? That's a great question. Um, I think that the first thing that I want to do is reach out to the community, the, the Congress members whose communities are really similar to Montana's and start to build a coalition of uh, of folks that have similar values and uh, diverse communities that we have in Montana because I think that the issues that, you know, we're, no one congressman from Montana is going to walk into D.C., snap their fingers, and, and change the world. Right. Right. And so I think the way that we build power as a state is by reaching out to other folks who have similar issues to ours and build those coalitions. And, and I think. And regardless of which side of the aisle they're on. Exactly. And I think healthcare is a perfect example. I think that that's the issue people are telling me they want us to address most urgently. Uh, and that's the issue that I think I have. Uh, I've built a, a solid team around me here in Montana who are informing me about what it means to deliver health care in a rural state, uh, what it means to deliver health care in America today. And I think it gives me an opportunity to build some coalitions with others that give us a chance to bring some really practical tools forward from both sides of the aisle that will help us make progress towards ad- uh, addressing health care. You know, and, and what you're speaking to um, is very important. I remember... Uh when having a conversation with the late Conrad Burns, a Republican senator, very partisan Republican senator, you know, spoke the party line often in public settings, but told me once privately that uh, the one of the persons in Congress that he respected and admired the most and he worked with a lot and co-sponsored legislation with was Hillary Clinton. And, you know, he wouldn't say that on the campaign trail, but when he was trying to get something done in D.C. in a time where there was a little bit more civility than there is now, you know, right. that, that was a relationship that was important to him. I remember that, uh, uh, again, contrary to public perception, um, you, Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy were very close friends, and they were completely on the opposite side. But where they could agree, they did work together. So, you know, the pathway that you're talking about makes a lot of sense if we're going to try to resolve the kind of, uh, you know, divergence and, that we're seeing in, in D.C. at the moment. That's true. Do you have you and your and your fellow primary candidates talked about like, hey, you know, whatever happens, we're here to support each other at the end. And, you know, has that conversation been had yet? Yeah. So we've I have not had that individual conversation with every candidate, but we have been on the campaign trail enough in forums and right. things. And a couple of us, you know, there's a few of us who I think are much more likely to move forward out of this primary. Uh, you know, yes, where things are, I think. I think I'm considered a front runner or co front runner at this point in this race. Mm. Um, and I think with John that, Heenan, right? Yeah, I yeah. think that's uh, fair to say. Um, and I think, I think he and I have both. We certainly we had a beer together before either of us announced we were going to do this, and uh, and made a commitment that we both felt like Greg Gianforte did not reflect Montana, and uh, and we felt like this party deserved to have a couple of voices at the table about uh, the diversity sure. of views in the party. And I think we're both committed to supporting each other after the primary. I hope that's true of him, and it's still true of me. Uh, and I think that there's not a single person on the Democratic side that I wouldn't uh, embrace and promote over Greg Gianforte in this next sure. year cycle. So let's talk about the, the thing that no one likes about running for office, raising money. 
How has that experience been? I mean, I know running running Five Valleys Land Trust and maybe other organizations, you've ro- raised money, but not for yourself personally to fund your own efforts yeah. as an individual. How has that experience been? You know, I have tried really hard to not think of this as a personal effort, and maybe that's helped me. And I've really tried to think of this as really similar to my work at Five Valleys mm-hmm. Land Trust. Right. And, and the way I've approached fundraising on this is that you can't do anything in this world without having the resources to do it. Um, you know, I think, let me just preface this by saying our system is broken. It's completely rigged right now so that the wealthiest have the best shot of succeeding at, at winning at office. Sure. The wealthiest people can influence decisions after people are in office. That said, I knew that was the case before I get in, so it's not like this was a surprise right. to me. But the way I raised money at Five Valleys Land Trust, as I said, I have a, a vision for I want to take this organization. I have a set of things that I want to accomplish. And... I go out to people and I say, if you believe in this direction and vision, then I need your help financially to achieve it. And I've tried to do the same thing with my political campaign to say, here's why I'm running. Here's what I believe in. If you believe in the same values and you want to go in the same direction, I want you to contribute to this campaign. One person in my entire time of, of fundraising pushed back at me and said, I'll, fund, I'll give you money, but only if you do X. Really? Only one person so far has done That's that. pretty good. And I pushed back on them. And Did I said, you take the money? No, no, I didn't. You know what I said to them? I, I'll, I said to them, look, I, I'm a scientist. I believe in evidence-based decision-making. There's not an amount of money you can give me to change my mind, but if you can give me a better argument than I can give you, you can change my mind on almost any issue. I, you know, I am interested in the best possible solution and outcome, and I'm not married to my mm. own ideas. What I want is the best idea. So... So you don't need to pay me to change my mind. you got to convince me. Let's and do, he couldn't. Let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Grant Keir. He is running for the U.S. House here in Montana. And he's going into the primaries. The primary is June 5th. Coming up shortly. All right. Less than two months. I mean, one of the telltale signs that the system is completely broken and rigged is the fact <laughs> I was just watching that uh, – uh, Governor Scott's going to run for Senate in Florida, Florida. and he's going to have to raise $150 million for a $200,000 job. Where on this planet would that make any sense? I got to raise $150 million to get a job that pays me $200,000 a year. It's just, it's just completely out of whack. Well, let me, well, I'm going to push back on that. The job itself is a $200,000 job, but the business and the decisions he's making is going to impact billions of dollars. Well, that's why people are willing to so, give him $150 right. million. Dollars. But it's like, right, it's not a CEO job where, you know, he's... But you're not going to get $150 million to run without strings attached. And that's the problem with, you know, unlimited, camp, you know, unlimited Let's campaign spending. Let's ask the spending. scientist. Let's ask what, the scientist. What is that? How does that sit with you? You know, I think those those unlimited expenditures are, you know, the whole system is broken. Let me start there. And let me just, you know, what I didn't know getting into this is how rigged it is for it, people of individual wealth to succeed when they're running for office, mm-hmm. right? Because um, there are no limits to how much of your own money you can spend to win. Or loan money. yourself. Or right. lo- quote unquote loan yourself. Or have your lawyer pay on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> a little topical <laughs> humor here. If you have a loan a lawyer with those kinds of reasons. I mean, what he's paying off. Yeah. Well, yeah um, it's a home equity loan. So, so right there, the system is rigged so that the people who end up in office are people who have a limited life experience. They have um, wealth that insulates them from the problems of our world. Right. And I think um, that's why we see so many people who are making decisions in Washington that don't reflect on changes that we want to see made back at home that impact our everyday lives. In addition to that, we have a system where corporations can now put unlimited amounts of money right. into super PACs. Um, what that means... And, and it really does come down to how much money does it take to win? Because all of this is about, can you get your message to the right number of people? Um, and you've got to have the right message and you've got to get it out to people. And it is because there's unlimited wealth. It just becomes a competition of who's going to throw sure. the most money at this. Do you think, hey, do you think that external money, out-of-state money is going to come to whoever the candidate is for the Democratic ha- seat? Like, will a Soro, like, will someone come in with money? Well, the question is, would you, you know, would you take it? And then would you take kind of it is the question. Would I take out-of-state money? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've already asked people from out of the state of Montana (laughs) to support my campaign. There are lots of people who don't live in Montana who either have homes here or spend time here and love this state and care a lot about the future of this place. 
So I don't have a hard time taking money. What I have a hard time doing is taking unlimited money from people who are not reporting that they're giving it to me. Right. Um, what I would like to see is a system where I'm not sure. having to take money from anyone. But right now, you can go online and find the name and amount of every dollar that somebody has given to my campaign. So you know who's influencing me, who's trying to support right. me or not support me. And, and that, to me, that level of transparency is number one most important. Sure. Um, do I think that the, the big corporate funds are going to come in? Look, we saw in the last election, uh, you know, Greg Gianforte has been in office now for, what, eight months? Yes. Um, and he is already, I think, fourth highest recipient of NRA funding. Is that right? Well, didn't in, NRA in the last Congress. cycle give $31 million for campaigns? And they put, I think, uh, Not even that 300, much. about 350000 into his campaign. To so there are these big, big entities that are going to put money into these right. campaigns. And there's talk now of the Senate race for Montana uh, costing seventy million dollars for the Senate race in Montana. I remember wow when I first you know fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago, talking to Max Bacchus, asking him how much he needed to raise to run for Senate in Montana. He said four million dollars, and that's what estimates have been for this race that I'm in. Is that right? Most people have said uh, to win the primary, you need to raise just about a million dollars, and to win the general, you got to raise around four point two. That's what that's what the estimates have been given, and that's that to me is just an outrageous use of resources yeah. in our country right now. Um, when you look at the Senate and House races combined, you're looking at about a third of the total deficit in our state budget spent on campaigns. Campaigns that is absolutely wrong. Well, I always thought, Maybe. and I don't know if you agreed. I always thought, you know, some of the other democracies that have, you know, a 90 day campaign period, it's federally funded. Both candidates get the same amount of money. Yeah. Makes imminent sense. Yeah, and the F and you you get the FCC to say, look, you're going to have a, a certain number of public service announcements that are allocated to your right. race, and they're going to be aired on local TV and radio, and you can choose that. You know, if you get 20 minutes over the course of the whole campaign, you can choose what to do with those 20 minutes on your own over the course of the campaign. I think there's some really sensible ways that we could change this quickly so that people. One, don't have to put up with people like me calling and asking for money or holding events and asking for money. And two, don't get caught up in these, you know, our whole media market gets saturated with what are usually pretty horrible messages about individual candidates and campaigns and issues. Well, then there's this huge weird competition of can we suck up as much available airtime so the other candidate can't get any? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, can you comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> On a bright side. <laughs> on the bright side. <laughs> on the bright side. What I do believe, and I have seen this out on the campaign trail, is that so many Montanans choose their candidates by word of mouth. Still choose their candidates by retail politics of who's showing up, shaking hands, and looking them in the eye. And who do they, you know, when, when someone out in, you know, I've had people show up for my events in Mile City because they got a phone call from their cousin in Helena say, hey, this guy's great. You got, you know, I know that a guy from Western Montana might be a, a surprise to you, but go out and meet him and they show up and then they meet you and then they feel good about you and they talk to other people. And I think, I think we still have the advantage of Montana of people caring who's going to show up and what kind of person are you. Can you out hustle John Heenan? I mean, that's because that really is what you're saying. It's like being able to shake hands and kiss babies and log miles. And that really... Now the sprint is between now and June fifth. That's right. This is the, this now is the time when it all matters. Now is the time when people are kind of out of the fog of the special election. They're paying attention. Right. They care about this race. They suddenly realize they're going to have to vote in uh, sixty days, and they're curious about who their contenders mm. are. And absolutely, I think I, you know, uh, part of my background is uh, being a national champion amateur mountain bike racer. Mm. And uh, and actually raced for a tiny bit on the professional mountain biking circuit. Um, I know how to run a long race. I know how to save my energy, energy to the, the end. end. <laughs> yeah. And I know when you let your competitors get out ahead. And I know when you uh, push and you go out in the drafting. <laughs> and uh, and I think we've been really strategic about our approach to this campaign. I think I have the best team uh, in this state to win. And I think that from day one, we've played from the same playbook with the same tone and message. And I think we have the strategy that's going to win this primary. And that's what you need, right? I mean, you have to have that kind of cohesion mm. and organization in this era to win. I mean, you need 
social media and you need all the other things and you're doing all those. Yes. But you have to have the on the ground. You have to have on the ground troops to make this happen. That's right. You have to have a good get out the vote GOTV on the last couple of days and get yep. your your supporters out there. Right. You pray it doesn't rain. You know all those kinds of things. And uh, that's right. You know and. Uh, Let's give, give us some of your background. I, I, the last time we interviewed, I'm sure we asked you the same thing, but where were you born? Where are you from? Where, yeah. How long have you been here? So uh, I was born in Kansas. Uh, not long after I was born, uh, my dad walked out and my mom was left with my older brother and I. She had always wanted to, she'd always loved the Rockies and wanted to live in the Rockies. Um, she was a registered nurse and had gone to, trained in Denver. So she moved us to Colorado and she raised my brother and I there on her own. Right. Um, about, uh, I was there through college, went to the University of Colorado, where I met my wife in graduate school. Um, when we left, when we finished graduate school, um, I ended up working as a well site geologist in Wyoming on natural gas rigs for a little while. And then we ended up moving to England and I worked uh, for an engineering company there. And oh. My job was uh, managing a team of engineers and we tested civil engineering infrastructure, roads, bridges, railway tunnels. Uh, tested the integrity of these uh, engineering uh, features and then helped municipalities and countries figure out what the right way it was to reinvest and make sure that if they needed to replace infrastructure or they could just uh, make small maintenance changes to keep up their infrastructure. Uh, there I really saw firsthand how our country was falling behind the rest of the world in terms of its investment in infrastructure and frankly the way we set policy. I think um, I think I realized firsthand that other countries were starting to plan 10 years, 25 years, 50 years out, while our country was more and more focused on single election cycles and individual annual budget cycles. Next quarter. <laughs> Next yeah. quarter. Yeah. And, uh, Be lucky. and we moved back because we believed then, and I still believe now this is the greatest nation on earth, and I think Montana is the greatest mm. state in the nation. Um, but I am really worried about the direction we're headed, and I think those life experiences gave me a sense that... Um, there's a really big world out there and people are more than happy to see us stumble so that they can now compete. And I think it's really important right mm. now that we are mindful of our place in the world and we are doing everything we can to invest in technology and infrastructure and education so that we uh, remain the country that has the strongest economy that can move forward and that is innovating at a pace that the rest of the world envies. So I have to ask you this. You're an evidence-based guy. You know, you hold you hold that standard up. What what is you, what are you thinking every day when you watch the president of the United States? You know, do what he does. You know, some people say it's a sh it's a show, it's hyperbole, it's a you know his own staff. I'm not even talking that way. His own staff say you can't really listen to what he says every day. He doesn't really mean what he says. What is that whole specter around the president? do for you when you're looking at this from a, from a candidate perspective? From a candidate perspective. Um, I mean, it, it'd be so easy to just jump out there as a, you know, and just, a, you know, attack on a daily basis what he's yeah. saying. And, and that doesn't necessarily. I, I actually, you know, as a candidate and as somebody who really values strategic thinking, um, I think that's just what he wants. And I think that's just what the Republican Party wants. They want us to get swept up in the daily headlines mm. and forget the big picture. And I, I've seen this on our campaign where people, um, you know, they, they seem to have these big picture issues they're worried about and they're really concerned about. And, and some people come to me and talk about, we've got to start addressing climate change. We've got to deal with health care. Mm. And then that week's headline rises to the top and people get so distracted from the bigger picture of, of budget deficits and, and federal debt. And they start thinking about an individual headline and that week's crisis. And they forget about the bigger picture. And I think it's Trump's intention to distract us from the bigger issues that are happening in the world and in our country right now by these, right. these crazy I mean, normally, ideas. Normally, Republicans would not be sitting in a position where they've led to a trillion dollar deficit. I mean, the president inherited a 500 billion dollar deficit. It was bad enough. Now it's a trillion in, you know, 14, 15 months. Normally, if you had two Republicans in D.C. and a president who was threatening international trade policy that was going to devastate Montana agriculture, they would be standing up and hollering. Yes. And they are tight-lipped right now.
Mm-hmm. Nothing is normal about the world no, we live and, in today. Yeah, so you're going to well, enter. That's why the stakes are so much higher with the right. race that you're running. Yeah, but to mean, me, that's exactly why we have to we have to be aware of the chaos that Donald Trump is trying to create. And I think if you, for me, running in this race to try to pri- provide real leadership, is just to keep people's minds focused on the real issues that we need to be facing together as a country, mm. and to not get swept up in the daily chaos, and to not get trapped into a what I think is a, a maybe a national political rhetorical device to to convince people that only Republicans and Democrats exist and we all hate each other because I think that's the trap that's being set for everyone like me running this race right now. Mm. Sure. And it's hard. It is hard for them and, and, and respected some respected politicians. And it's hard to keep the focus on the important issues when every single day there's a, a new fire, you know, the, real or imaginary or whatever that kind of d- distracts you from health care and environment and budget deficits and, and trade policy that, that in normal times would every one of those single things would become the number one thing on the national agenda. That's exactly right. And, you know, now we're dealing with, you know, president lawyer, you know, president's lawyer, you know, being raided by the FBI. I mean, all that kind of stuff is, is sort of like white noise over a situation where you can't really focus in on what's important to, uh, to focus on. We have, we have tenuous nuclear agreements with Iran right now and, uh, and a relationship mm. with North Korea that is incredibly tense. Um, those are issues that should be front and center on people's minds right now. And, and how we treat our agreements with North Korea will have a huge impact on whether or not we will ever get North Korea to the table to negotiate mm. on nuclear weapons. None of that gets talked about in our everyday media. And it is, uh, these are some of the most critical decisions that will be made in generations, potentially. Um, but we're not even talking about those in the media right now because we're worried about whether or not somebody, you know, Donald Trump's attorney got raided yesterday. Right. What do you make of what uh, the whole Scott Pruitt EPA um, controversy with respect to just misuse, abuse of funds, or removing man-made right, and then also from what, the climate change policy, they're not allowed to talk yeah, about some that of the anymore. policies they're trying. To, uh, thankfully, they're inept, so they can't get a lot done. But, well, I, I wish he were inept. He's actually um, been incredibly adept at dismantling the EPA before our eyes. And I think um, I think he's probably among, I think the reason Trump has been willing to tolerate all of sure. the headlines he's received is because he's been so good at achieving uh, massive deregulation. Uh, and I think this is uh, one, you know, these are sort of three different issues, but right. one, I think that we're seeing misuse of funds um, and really mm. questionable ethical standards from everybody in the cabinet right now. <laughs> and I think uh, as somebody who ran an organization, I right. deeply believe in corporate culture. Right. I deeply believe in corporate culture. And it's something that you don't get by accident. It's something that you get with great intentionality. Mm. And I think we have a president right now who is more than happy to skirt all of the ethics um, and to use anything at his disposal to create a better outcome for himself. And I think he has brought in a lot of cabinet members who look the same way at their posts uh, in our government. And I think that that's really troubling to me. I think that there's, um, I think that we deserve a higher standard and I think and hope that these people will all be exposed for all that they're doing to our country, all in an effort to improve their own uh, outcomes as individuals and their corporate interests. Um, and I think that day will come. And I think, um, I think we'll look back on this as one of the most uh, mm. embarrassing administrations as a country that we have ever seen. We'd be remiss not to talk about the issues related to school violence and guns. Montana is, uh, you know, I I think a lot of people are fond of saying Montana has one million people, three million cows, and four million guns. You know, what is your what what is a a science based rational way to deal, you know, with the situation we have? Great question. And yes, we have the second highest rate of gun ownership in the country, next only to Wyoming. Um, You know, as a scientist, I have been calling for some time for a a repeal of something called the Dickey Amendment. In 1996, the NRA lobbied Congress to cut off all funding to the Center for Disease Control. What they essentially did is said, the federal government cannot research the impacts of gun violence in our country and how any of our laws might be changed to reduce violence around guns in our country. 
Uh, I think that did a huge disservice to all of us who want objective information to mm. make good decisions. Sure. And so um, I'm really happy to report that in this omnibus bill that was passed, that that was repealed. So now the CDC has uh, permission again to begin research. What we need to do now is fully fund them so that we can begin the process of researching uh, what policies we can change to make our schools safer. Uh, and as somebody who believes in evidence-based decision-making, um, that's what I want to make a good decision. There is a lot of political rhetoric right now. Um, but I, look, I marched with the students from Missoula. I talked on the phone with students mm. from Bozeman and Helena about what gun violence looks like in their schools. Um, these kids are very respectful of Second Amendment rights. These are kids who grow up in Montana with guns too, um, but they are going to school in a time that is not like what any of us as right. adults sure. have ever experienced. I went to a school that was pretty violent, but the violence was... You know, putting razor blades and apples and throwing them down the hall. I mean, they, nobody wanted to get hit by one, <laughs> but uh, that's not an AK-47. That's Manhattan, New York. Yeah, yeah that, that's in New York City. Let's, let's let's put a point in this, and we'll come back after this break, okay? Our guest is Grant Kier. He's running for U.S. House here in Montana. Back after this. All right, we are back with Grant Keir running for the U.S. House here in Montana. Grant, will you drill down a little bit on your gun comments and give me some more I insights into your thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to just research, I think it's really important. I think intuitively when we say we have a background check system, most Americans think, great, that means if somebody's going to buy a gun, they're going to get checked out. And if they're safe to own one, they will. And if they're not, they won't. Well, the system doesn't work that way right now. And so... Um, without going into every single nuance, I'll just say I think we have a long way to go, and we've started the process, but we have much further to go to make a real background check system that I think intuitively Americans already think we have and want. Uh, and last but last, uh, not least, I'll just say um, I, you know, I'm not calling for a ban on weapons, but this is why I think it's important to listen. When I talked to those students that uh, around the state, um, some really great insights came that I think are important to share. Um, one is how reasonable these kids are. So when it came to assault rifles, these kids in Helena were talking around a table and they came up with, well, you know, we're not trying to take people's guns away, but what if we had uh, a longer waiting period for these assault style weapons? And maybe the waiting period is say, let's say it's six months when mm -hmm. you're 21 years old. And then it's maybe five months when you're 22 years old and four months when you're 23 years old. So that as you get older, the waiting period is much less, but when you're young and, and there's a lot of potential for harm to come, but it's a longer waiting period. That seems, seems like a really rational way to think about what, doing things. And the, and the last thing I'll share is um, some insights, and this came from discussions in Helena and Bozeman. Right now, we have the, one of the highest rates of suicide in the country in Montana. Well, Lake County has the highest teenage suicide rate in the United States. Yes. And, um, and I think is rivaled um, by Beaverhead County. And what kids are seeing is that their friends are using firearms to take their lives. And what kids are facing right now, um, they feel like what they need is the support and the lack of, you know, and breaking down the stigma so that they can get the help they need. You know, not, this is not about the Donald Trump style of saying only crazy people are using guns to kill each other. This is about realizing that Gun violence in Montana looks really different than a lot of places. And one thing we need to do to help our kids is provide uh, a society that does not stigmatize people who ask for help uh, around mental health, that provides adequate support for people who are um, struggling with uh, substance abuse addiction, and really helps students turn themselves around before they're ever in a position where the stress that they're going through in their lives puts in a position where they're thinking of taking their lives or anyone else's. I've heard elected officials say that health care isn't a right, that food isn't a right in America. What, what's, what's your position on, on health care? You know, I, you go, to, um, go to any emergency room administrator and ask them if health care is a right. We've decided long ago, well, you could call it a right or a privilege. I don't, it's a responsibility we have as a country with good medicine to provide it to people. And right now, the way that we provide it is we say that if you don't have insurance or if you're in dire straits, you're going to get all your care through the emergency room. That's an insane way to provide care to our country. Mm -hmm. um, the richest I, country on the face of the earth, that's right, by with, the way. The, with, with absolutely astounding medical care. 
So um, my position is we have got to move towards universal coverage of every, you know, every American needs to have health coverage as fast as we can get there. And I don't care if it's paid for by a single payer or by a lot of payers. We need to do it in a way that's sustainable financially, whether it's the individual or the whole country that's paying. I, you know, I think there's a, a plan in place that matches a lot of things I've been talking about on the campaign trail called Medicare Extra, which is a really practical and pragmatic way to get to get court towards that. That's what I'd like to get working on right away when I get to Congress. That's a good first step towards, uh, you know, you know, accomplishing something meaningful for all Americans. Most Americans want a, a you know, coverage for everyone. Yes. I think by and large. I agree. So, it's true. Real quick, let's let's end it on a, on a nice, lighthearted note. Talk about a little bit about your family, where you're living, and you know. Great. Well, to make this as lighthearted as possible, yeah. um, I am happy to announce that my daughter Fiona, who is nine years old, got uh, her first puppy a couple of days ago. <laughs> Puppies and campaigns are <laughs> well. I, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be on the campaign trail for the next uh, sixty days straight, and. Uh, and she's always wanted a puppy. But uh, my wife, uh, Bex, is a uh, professor here at the university in mm. geology. Uh, she studies sort of earthquake systems and a lot of uh, figuring out how to convey risks around earthquakes and other natural hazards to people so that they can live safer lives. My daughter, Fiona, um, is nine years old, and she's uh, as proud as can be that I'm doing this. I'm honored to have their support. Um, and I, you know what I often say on the campaign trail is that all of my life, all of my success in my life has been thanks to strong women. And I was yeah. raised by a single mom. Uh, I'm married to the strongest, smartest woman I know. And I'm trying to raise uh, a young woman who will reflect the strength and history of women in Montana. And, um, and I will be an ardent and strident supporter of mm. women and women's rights in this race and on the, uh, when I'm in Congress. Terrific. Grant, it's been, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We wish you, uh, Success in the next sprint, this uh, less than two month sprint, and we look forward to having you back after the uh, after the primary campaign. It's always great to see you guys. Thank you for having me, great and to see I, you too. I look forward to coming back. Uh, hopefully, when I'm serving you in Congress. Terrific. All right, thank you, Grant Arnie. See you next week. See you then. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know. I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO.